A new millennium beckons, and with it come prophets of doom and disaster. And it seems that ever since the world began, someone somewhere has forecast its imminent demise. In the 17th century, James Usher, Bishop of Armagh, predicted the world would end in 1996. But his apocalyptic vision, like thousands of others, lies unfulfilled in the dustbin of history. Doomsday has a peculiar appeal, and over a thousand soothsayers, end-of-the-worlders, and hangers-on are holding a prophet's conference in Phoenix, Arizona, where the talk is of earth changes, asteroid impacts, alien landings, and the traditional prophecies of the Native Americans. The prophecies, as somebody came up to me and said that they wanted to hear about the prophecies, you are the prophecy. You know, the coming together of the peoples is part of the prophecy. The prophecy says that we are one. We can talk about the devastation of the earth and about how it's in balance because it's cyclical, it's happening again. And time is short. We don't have a lot of time. I've been reading everything I can, going to as many prophecy seminars as I can to be prepared because unless we know how to purify water, store food, grow things, we'll have a terrible time uh, surviving once the disasters strike. I purchased two guns so to help with my personal survivor, survival and uh, just trying to learn where the safe areas are. We were going to change the earth. The changes will be catastrophic. They will be very frightening for a lot of people. The current rumor here is that the Queen of England is buying up huge tracts of land in Colorado in case the forecast earth changes do happen. A new location for the British Empire. The ones that will stay after the earth changes are the ones that will rebuild, and we will have a millennium of peace. We need to understand we're in a process, and this whole idea of doomsday is a time concept. Uh, my own feeling is that we're in probabilities. Nobody knows what's going to happen. Anything can happen. But the outcome is ultimately going to be very positive. They're beings. They're here, and they picked up the threads of these teachings. I think a lot of them possibly are ETs taking up incarnation here. OK, it sounds weird, but I believe that. OK, it's possible. Okay? Not only that, they've got people who possibly are walking the earth right now who, believe it or not, may have been disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. Did you know that? All the world's major religions, the Mayans, Christian prophecies, the Hebrew, says that this is the time for the transformation of consciousness from a third dimensional into a fourth dimensional. It's also the change from the Piscean Age into the Aquarian Age. What a wonderful time to be living in. Man, this is terrific. This is the golden age of the doomsday industry, people tapping into basic anxieties about the years ahead. And coincidentally or not, more prophecies seem to focus on the approaching millennium than at any other time. Some dates are quite specific, others somewhat vague. First, a pyramid prophecy for September 2001. Some say a timeline engraved in the Great Pyramid of Cheops will signal a major shift in our consciousness. Fulfillment date unknown, but the most famous prophecy of all comes from the Book of Revelation, written around 90 AD. A truly apocalyptic account of the Battle of Armageddon, where the forces of Satan and the beast are finally defeated by the followers of Christ. For believers, this will be the true millennium, a thousand-year paradise until Doomsday's door opens once again. December the 22nd, 2012. A Mayan prophecy predicting the end of their fifth age, which they believe would be destroyed either by water, wind, earthquake, or fire. A Hopi Indian prophecy, fulfillment date imminent, Chief Dan Averhammer, 109 years old, is a keeper of the prophecies and one of the last surviving elders of the Hopi nation. 
The Hopi were intensely secretive about prophecies which they say were given to them by the creator Massor over a thousand years ago. One of these was a symbolic wall drawing. It's their prophetic road for life. This line leads to chaos, the ways of the whites, and this to the true way back to the creator. These two circles signified the two world wars, but the third could prophesy a war to end all wars before the world enters a new fifth age. Not long ago, in an unprecedented move, the elders revealed their prophecies in newsletters, issued as a warning to the world at large. Chief Dan believes it's up to us to change our ways, for the end times are fast approaching. July 1999, a prophecy from the 16th century doctor Michel Nostradamus, who wrote his visions of the future in obscure four-line poems or quatrains. At this time, he says, a great king of terror would ascend from the skies and war will reign supreme. Could he have meant an asteroid? Or a bomb? Whatever it might mean, we won't have long to wait. A strange prediction for 1998 comes from Edgar Cayce, the American-born healer and prophet. Over 50 years ago, he predicted the discovery of a time capsule hidden beneath the Sphinx, which would finally reveal the truth about Atlantis, as well as predicting the arrival of a great initiate who would guide us through cataclysmic events due in the next three years. Casey believed these natural disasters would begin in the 1960s and climax at the end of this century. His ideas have inspired people like Loria Dale Toy, whose prophecies culminate in 2009. Prophecy is not prediction. Prophecy is instead this very heartfelt uh, communication that says you must change or otherwise these things may happen. And so at the, at the pivotal point of all the prophecy is choice. Payson, Arizona, headquarters of I Am America, from this modest office come forth apocalyptic prophecies of a dramatically changed world due in the next five years. Here, they produce maps of earth changes based on psychic revelations between Laurie Toy and entities she calls the Ascended Masters. They spoke about a meteor that would hit somewhere in the Nevada desert. They said that that would upset all of the tectonic plates here in North America that we would have a series of earthquakes alongside the activation of the Ring of Fire. And that would cause the sinking of California. That there would be another devastating earthquake that would hit the Pacific Northwest in the United States. And that would sink the states of Washington and Oregon and leave the Cascade Mountains as a range of islands. We would see flooding everywhere. They spoke about that there would be global warming all over the entire planet, that we'd see the melting of both the North and the South Poles, that we would have a shifting of the poles, three distinct shifts, and that in the final shift, that it would actually be a shift in our consciousness, that it would cause us to change inside. Before her second marriage in 1990 to Leonard Toy, Laurie had been living as a farm wife in Idaho with her three small children. But a dozen years before that, when she was 22, she had a most peculiar encounter. I was working as an advertising salesperson for a weekly newspaper in Washington State, and I was called to go pick up an ad. So I drove out to this health food store, opened the door, walked in, and the lady at the counter uh, pointed her finger at me, just like this, and said, you have work to do for Master St. Germain. And of course, I was quite startled by that, and a little shocked and quite taken and thinking I'd better get my ad and get out of here. And, and I said, well, tell me, who is Master St. Germain? And, and she said, come here, you know. And so I followed her through these uh, neatly tiered rows of vitamins and uh, went into her back office. And on the wall was this huge picture of a man. And she says, this is the Comte de Master St. Germain. And I was quite startled when I saw that picture. I felt as if it was someone that I had known before. 
The experience affected her so much that Laurie then spent five years studying meditation and once more encountered Saint Germain and three other ascended masters who appeared in a strange recurring dream. That dream was a dream where I was greeted by four master teachers and they unrolled this map of the United States and they showed changes, earth changes, that were going to happen to the United States. Because the children were so little at the time, I wasn't ready to become quote unquote a prophet and put a sandwich board on me and walk the street and say, the end is near, because that was not who I was. I was a farm wife. Um, I, I was more concerned with getting my laundry hung up and my peaches canned. But the dream kept returning. And during her meditation exercises, the entities began to speak directly through her. Friends, realizing she was psychic, began to record the extraordinary details coming from the ascended masters. I remember the first time that they, that they actually showed the map again, what we did is that we got our own map that was laminated and we worked with erasable pens so that we could pen in the coastlines and actually follow as they were showing the new coastlines of the United States and the West Coast and the East Coast. In 1988, frightened but increasingly convinced by what she was being told, Laurie sold her house to fund the publication of the first map which revealed a drastically changed United States. She believes the changes have already begun and will peak within the next 10 years. The next step was to create a 3D world map, which doesn't bode too well for Europe. In Europe, the prophecies were equally devastating. Uh, they spoke about an earthquake that would hit Scandinavia and actually would sink areas of Sweden and Denmark. Uh, in England itself, Ireland is prophesied uh, to go underwater. We see that Scotland does remain, parts of uh, northern England also remain, but uh, areas, low-lying areas such as London are now all underwater. We see that France has broken apart into a series of small islands here. We see here uh, this little peninsula of land, which is Italy. New lands emerge off of Portugal here near Spain. It's not all doom and gloom, but it does seem the price we pay for a new age is the destruction of half the Earth. The high places like Sedona here in northern Arizona will become safe areas and golden cities will rise along power points on a newly vitalized planet. Alongside also the earth changes were the prophecies of the new times, the golden age, which they spoke a lot of. They spoke a lot of the universal brotherhood and sisterhood. They spoke a lot about the new technologies that earth would actually be renewed after it went through this purification, so to speak. If I gave you a date and said, this is not gonna to happen until uh, 2150, would you take any action? Would anyone else take any action? No one would. And the only thing that would happen is progressively things would become worse to where there would be no point of return. Today in this minute, there is a point of return. Today, we still have hope. Now their message is reaching millions on the internet. Through their worldwide website, they've attracted some 40,000 subscribers, clamoring for prophetic tapes, newsletters, books, and maps. But does Laurie believe any of this is really going to happen? I feel that there's a possibility these things could happen within my lifetime. Yes, I think they could. I think there's a very strong possibility. But uh, better yet, if they don't, that if we take heed and actually change the direction and the course that we're going, that we can actually create a better world for our children. So, if we act now, maybe we can prevent the opening of a doomsday door. Good news for future generations, but there's little we can do about death stars from space, which some believe is what Nostradamus forecasts for July 1999. <laughs> Cosmos has inspired poets, 
painters and scientists alike. And as we gaze out into the star fields, we seem to inhabit a deceptively ordered universe, everything knowing its place and running like clockwork. But within this apparent order drift universal vandals, packs of asteroids and anarchic comets which have already wreaked havoc for us here on Earth. Asteroids can creep up on us unawares. Uh, they can come from the direction of the sun, for example, a direction we can't look in with our telescopes, obviously, because the sky is too bright. And if a an asteroid did come from that direction, it may hit us without any warning at all. Asteroids are really off the scale uh, as far as devastation is concerned. There is no other natural phenomenon that we know of uh, that can wreak as much havoc as an asteroid or comet impact. For millions of years, our own moon has been vandalized by impacts, mostly from smaller meteorites, and even with its protective atmosphere, the Earth has never escaped. It's the astronomer's job to find out where and when our doomsday star might land. There's been a, a number of occasions that we've been hit before. Uh, the most recent that we're sure of is the 1930 Brazilian impact. Uh, before that, there was the Tunguska event in 1908, which leveled some thousand square kilometers of forest. That had an energy of something like 10 or 30 megatons. And going back still further, uh, uh, we, we see evidence for many smaller and sometimes even larger impacts. And particularly the most famous one would be the meteor crater in Arizona that left a crater one and a half kilometers across. And going back much further into time is the KT impact crater, which is a buried crater in the Yucatan Peninsula, some 200 kilometers across. And this was the impact which is associated with the final extinction of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. And clearly that had a very important role to play in the development and evolution of life on Earth. Without it, we wouldn't be here now. These very large impacts uh, occur on the average around about every five or 10 or 30 million years. And although there is only a very small chance that one of these objects would be heading for us within our lifetime, sooner or later it will happen. And sooner or later this indeed will be the end of a technological civilization. Scientists believe the size of the object that hit the planet 65 million years ago was only 10 kilometers across. Look at that compared to London. 10 kilometers is the distance from Buckingham Palace to the Greenwich Observatory. And yet that size object killed off half the life on the planet. These are very rare events, but there are thousands of smaller asteroids orbiting dangerously near our Earth. The energy of such an impact of a one kilometer asteroid is a million times the energy that was used at Hiroshima in 1945. And you don't need any training in nuclear warfare to have a feel for it that a million times the energy at Hiroshima would be a terrible event that would destroy the Earth's atmosphere and thereby become a global event. And it has been studied in fair detail and it is just uh, too terrible for, for words. And uh, billions of people would die and society, of course, would be totally destroyed. And it would be an agonizing, very slow death. It's just a horrible thing. And so this is the first priority. We must find these objects, and we must do it as soon as possible. It's a race against time. And today's doomsday watchtowers are observatories in places like Kitt Peak, Arizona. Here, astronomers in the Space Watch team prepare to scan the night skies in search of potential invaders. They call them near-Earth objects. Tom Gerrells developed new photoscan techniques for tracking down these rogue asteroids. And tonight, he's checking on three objects seen the evening before. We know that there are 1,700 one-kilometer asteroids that could hit the Earth sometime in their history. Any one of these could have our name on it and we don't know it. That's a challenge to the astronomers. 
So with the eye, I'm looking for faint trails and extended objects like comets. The computer uh, is also doing that, and is particularly looking for uh, brighter objects. This is the third scan, and now the objects will be marked, uh, the newly found objects. These telltale signals are recording objects which at some point might collide with our Earth. They all uh, present a hazard, even that fifth size, if it had hit a person or a cow, there would have been death. So they all are very hazardous if they hit the Earth. Most of these asteroids are in circular orbits, quite stable configuration in the asteroid belt, but there's so many of them that they collide among themselves. And these fragments can fly all over the place and then get under the gravitational action of Jupiter that can throw them to the inner parts of the solar system where, where the Earth is. And, and, and of course, Mars can be hit and, and the Moon and Venus and Mercury and in fact, even the sun can be hit by these objects. Comets are faster and less predictable than asteroids. They can literally come out of the blue with very little warning. In 1994, Jupiter was hit by pieces of the Shoemaker-Levy comet, which was only discovered a year earlier. We wouldn't have stood a chance if it had headed for the Earth instead. Hale Bob was seen by millions in the spring of 1997, but that too was discovered only 12 months before. So we have to be constantly on guard because the odds of being hit are now shorter than winning the lottery. I'm fairly relaxed and sanguine about the possibility of being hit by an asteroid or comet. They are, after all, uh, very low probability events, but very high consequence events. And that's completely the other way around from other risks that we're used to in everyday life. When you get in your car, for example, you're in a fairly high risk situation, but low consequence. Highly consequential for yourself if you die, of course, but low consequence for the world at large. Were an asteroid or comet uh, be found on a collision course right now, uh, there's frankly very little we could do about it. We have the technology to deal with this problem, but the first thing you have to realise is that the one thing we don't want to do is to break up the incoming object, to, to pulverise it. By doing that, we simply turn a cannonball into a cluster bomb. We end up with more problems than we started with. What we need to do is to push it out of the way, to modify its orbit slightly so it misses. For the future, there's no doubt in my mind that planetary defence, as it's become known, is going to become a major preoccupation. While the Pentagon plans trips to divert or even blow up dangerous asteroids, Jonathan Tate and a team of leading scientists have set up Space Guard UK to alert us to the dangers. The Tate's children, Doff and Becky, with their vested interest of the future, have designed this worldwide website, which reaches a global audience on the internet. The aim of the Space Guard project is to develop, or at least to encourage, governments to develop a global surveillance system. The problem with this threat is that we can't yet totally quantify what the threat actually is. We need a surveillance system to work out or to find out how many threatening bodies there are out there. Tom Gerrells pioneered just such a scheme. But if we really want to know when the next doomsday asteroid or comet comes into view, we need to spend some 50 million pounds on a global network of six telescopes and about 10 million pounds a year to run them. But not all governments are behind the project. 
Well, government response so far has been lukewarm, to say the least. We already know that we could do the whole project three times over for the amount they're going to spend on the Millennium Dome. There is a much publicised donation that the UK government has made to NEO Research through the European Space Agency. Sadly, if you do the sums, the total given by UK PLC to the global project is £5,928.57. We're talking about not just the survival of civilization, which is important, obviously, in its own right, but also the long-term survival of the human race, which, if nothing is done, if we don't step off the planet, putting it in those terms, we will simply be wiped out when the next large comet or asteroid hits the Earth within the next 30 million years. So in the long term, humanity is doomed unless it steps off the planet. And that's really the fundamental point. Here we are now, end of the 20th century, are exactly facing this watershed with the capability to do it. It's the only question is whether we have the willpower. In the future, our ultimate survival might well lie on other planets. But for the moment, at least, we're faced with surviving down here on Earth, where we've become incredibly skillful at creating doomsday weapons of our own. During the Cold War years, doom was writ large in the skies, but governments gamely set out to reassure us should the worst ever happen. There are two kinds of attack, with warning and without any warning. Sundays, holidays, vacation time, we must be ready every day, all the time, to do the right thing if the atomic bomb explodes. Duck and cover. Duck. <laughs> And the British approach was altogether more pragmatic. One idea is to make a lean-to of wood resting against an inside wall. Strong boards or doors taken from their hinges are quite good. Then cover the wood with bags or boxes filled with some heavy material like sand, earth, books or rolled up clothes. Start collecting them now. Now, doomsday asteroids, earth changes, and anything nature can throw at us has prompted new survival strategies, especially here in the hill country of Texas, some 150 miles from the sea. At the moment, that is. But Earth Change prophets believe that in a few years' time, that could be an ocean down there. One time millionaire Antonio Carducci takes all this extremely seriously and is one of the few people who's actually doing something about it. He's put all his money into these high tech concrete domes hoping that 200-mile-an-hour hurricanes will pass him by. And just in case, he's laid in a few supplies. This is the storage room, and I did it especially for storage. I have no windows in here, and just, and just that door, and I have, the, I have it off my bedroom especially so that the, for, for, for security purposes. And in here I have 35 tons of canned food that I've canned myself, including what I have out in the garage. And in addition to that, I have some, some tomato sauce because I've canned some uh, spaghetti. Principally, I've canned rice and beans, about 12,000 pounds of rice and about 12,000 pounds of beans. I've got 10,000 pounds of, um, of millet and 10,000 pounds of rye. I think about 20 or 30 cases of dried cheese. I bought uh, a lot of peanut butter, and I've also bought uh, uh, tuna fish. And then I've got soap, ivory soap, and I've got detergent, laundry detergent. Antonio, now 79, came here a few years ago from Florida, where he made his fortune in property and share dealing, but then lost much of it. Now he's invested his life savings in this unique survival complex because nothing will shake his conviction that we're in for a hard time. I personally am 100% sure that these, that these changes are going to happen. I can't, nobody can be sure of the severity of it. 
and nobody can be sure of exactly where the coastlines will be and what will come up and what will come down. But there is going to be there is going to be a cleansing of the earth. There is going to be there is going to be earth changes, and there certainly is, and the vibrations are going to ascend up into a higher vibration, which is called the fifth dimension. I'm certain that that's going to happen. Right? See, and it's kind of an exciting time. Antonio's belief comes from the writings of Gordon Michael Scallion, who, like Laurie Toy and Prophet Edgar Casey, is also warning of dramatic earth changes in the next few years. He was told that these changes, called the Tribulation, had already begun and would peak around 1990. His Earth Changes reports claim a success rate of 55 hits out of 64 predictions for 1994, which included the California Northridge earthquake. But he also predicted that by 1995, San Francisco would have vanished into a massively reshaped bay. But for Antonio, there's more to it than just earth changes. The prophecies made for the United States are based on the energies that exist in the, in the United States at that time, see? And it's the same for England, it's the same for everybody, see? So, so when the, as the energies change, the prophecies change, see? And by energies, I mean if we become more loving, more forgiving, more non-judgmental, more compassionate, right? See, we can balance the negative energy on this planet, our own self, by our own thoughts and actions and deeds, rather than letting it happen through earthquakes. And, and so we have a choice. The choice we have is between evolving into a spiritual society, which is the which is the fifth dimensional society, or remaining indefinitely with a third dimensional material society. Those are the choices that we have to make. Antonio's choice of a safe haven was the high ground near the small town of Wimberley. When I first sold my apartment in Florida and headed out, I had no idea where I was going. I really headed out to look for a place, and I wound up in Wimberley. And why I wound up in Wimberley, I really don't know. This is where I wound up. But I have since come to understand that Wimberley is a very, very special place to God and that the energies, the consciousness energies, that the, the, the love is very, very high in this area. See? And, and I've been here in Wimbley two years. Now, how long I will live in Wimbley is anybody's guess, you know, but I don't think I'll be here forever. I think, I think I have a, a, a purpose for being here. I'm here when that purpose, when I've said, when I've fulfilled my reason for being here, I, I suppose I'll move on somewhere, you know. But before moving on, Antonio sees himself providing shelter for displaced families and their children. I just have a message intuitively. I just wound up with it one day that the, the ch children will be needing help, that they can't take care of themselves. And families, while they're out foraging for food, can't drag little children around, and one or two year old children. They'll need a place to put them, see? So that's what I think will happen here. And, as, and Scallion says there'll be five or six places throughout the United States where people will send their children to make sure they're safe, see? Well, somebody has to get them there. And I think that this will be this will be a stopping over place where people will br bring their children. There'll be a group of people here who will do, do the work and take care of them and things like that. And these will be spiritual people, and we'll get these people, these children, to safety. And that's that, that's what this is all about, you know. This is a spare bedroom that I've made, and I made them especially uh, large bedrooms. I, I made a, a, a three large bedrooms rather than. Uh, four or five small bedrooms because it's a lot easier to accommodate children in large bedrooms. You know, we'll probably be overpacked with children. They'll they'll be coming from everywhere, and I'm anticipating that. And for that reason, I bought a dozen sleeping bags because I feel feel as though the people who are actually taking care of the children won't have a place to sleep inside here. We'll have to sleep outside in, on the ground somewhere. You know, there will be people showing up here who form a become a committee taking care of the children, they'll know what to do, they'll be, be intuitively knowledgeable about what to do, and they'll take over, and they'll manage the whole business. My, my, I think that by, when that time comes, my, my job will be done. Antonio's domes, stores, and 5,000 gallons of propane have cost him some quarter of a million dollars. He even shipped a grand piano from Japan for his expected guests. But isn't it a lonely wait for Judgment Day? 
I don't feel lonely because, well, I have a, an awful lot of physical time on my hands. My mind is occupied. My mind is, is, is uh, severely occupied with the earth changes that are coming, with my responsibilities, with, you know, and for the past five years, I have been working on a program to get closer and closer to God, and I do that by affirmations. Each night, before I go to sleep at night, night I, I make certain affirmations, you know, an affirmation that I am something, you know. There's a list of affirmations that I make, but I always end it with that, that uh, every day in every way, I know God more, I understand God more, I love God more, and I serve God more. And those affirmations I've, I've been making now for about five years, and they just work. Antonio's survival strategy and his enduring faith may protect him from the elements, but if the earth changes come, not everyone will be all sweetness and light, and surely some will be beating a path to his domes. I bought some guns, but I haven't even bought some, any ammunition yet. I don't know how much to buy. I'm going to buy a little bit of ammunition, mostly to, to, to fire some shots to, to sort of as a warning or to scare somebody, but, but there are those risks, and I'm prepared to take them. See? But I just believe that, I believe I'll have help on the etheric level for, 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 for the safety that I need. After all, I'm, I've taken a, a sworn oath to surrender my ego to God's will, see? And, and, and God will not forsake me. I'm just sure of that, you know? You know, God does not forsake, forsake his friends. You don't forsake your friends, right? God does not forsake his friends. But neither his faith nor his domes will protect Antonio from the growing threat of infectious disease. Doomsday bugs. In the last 20 years, more than 30 new and highly infectious diseases have been identified around the world. And as we greet the new millennium, it looks as if more virulent disease makers could be heading our way. I don't know what you like about yours, but I'm going to take my two to be done straight away. Well, it's not the sort of thing you expect in this country, is it, sir? Mm. Disease has always been mankind's greatest killer. But with new vaccines and antibiotics, at last we seemed to be winning the battle. In the fight against infectious disease, Sir Alexander Fleming's discovery of penicillin was a real breakthrough. Thousands of men, thanks to penicillin and plasma, will come home to their thankful families. A whole world of peace to come will reap the benefits of this great wartime medical discovery. Science has won another victory over death. But Fleming had already warned that in time, organisms would become resistant to his new miracle drug. And that's exactly what's happening. Many felt that the advent of effective antibiotics and vaccines for the common childhood infections had m meant that, in a sense, the era of infectious disease mortality and morbidity was over. Well, in part, that was a very narrow view of the problem because if you look out of the developed world into the developing world, where the majority of the population is, infectious disease has remained the leading cause of human mortality, much greater than human conflict or non-infectious problems. Now, if you ask today in the developed world, you will find a change in view, because the AIDS pandemic highlighted how vulnerable the world's population is to new serious pathogens. The virus can be passed during sexual intercourse with an infected person. Anyone can get it, man or woman. So far, it's been confined to small groups, but it's spreading. So protect yourself and read this leaflet when it arrives. If you ignore AIDS, it could be the death of you. So don't die of ignorance. That was over a decade ago. Now, more than 30 million around the world are HIV positive. The question is, what can be done about it? We have now tools to look at how the virus changes inside an individual patient. And the rate of change has staggered everybody. Um, there may be in a, a patient who is in full stages of disease, something like 10 to the 9th or 10 to the 11th viral particles. And that means that you're essentially generating a new organism every day. So the pace of evolution is staggering. And that presents all sorts of problems in the development of drugs and vaccines 
and the fast pace of evolution of HIV has been the major reason why we don't have an HIV vaccine or it's taken 10 or 11 years to produce combinations of drugs that can handle the virus's evolution. New diseases appear all the time. In 1994, shocking news came out of Zaire that another deadly disease had emerged. It could kill within two weeks of infection. It was Ebola. We knew that Ebola was a new disease. The virus had been isolated, and it was a virus which had never been seen before. We knew that it was a very fatal disease because we had heard from missionaries who were operating the hospital where the epidemic occurred that it had killed many, many people. So when we went to the outbreak site, we were very careful to treat these patients with respect. Heyman's team traced the outbreak to a desperate lack of hospital facilities and finally managed to contain it. But new, easily transmissible diseases can appear anytime, anywhere in the world. It is a battle, it's a constant battle, and I think it's not being overly gloomy to say that it's a battle that's p whose pace is accelerating. If you look globally, there are two patterns of human behavior and the structure of our societies in the world that are causes for concern in terms of pathogen evolution. Evolution occurs most rapidly when population density of the pathogen is greatest. Population density of the pathogen is greatest when the host population it uses as an environment is at the highest density. So the first of these factors is the growth of what are called megacities in the world. These are cities over the size of about 8 million. Now, in the next 20 years, the number of megacities in the world is predicted to double. It is in these very high-density communities around the edges of megacities, a classic example is Rio de Janeiro, where one's likely to see the emergence of new infections, whether bacterial or viral, and their rapid spread because of large population density, poor health care, poor sanitation. So that's the first factor. The second factor, which I believe is very, very important, is, of course, our global mixing habits. Infectious diseases spread because of travel. Today, we can travel very rapidly. I can be here in London this morning, and tomorrow morning I can be in the center of Africa. With me, I could take an infection that could infect Africans, maybe an infection that they don't recognize because they've not had before, and I could cause an epidemic in Africa. Or I could take an organism that's resistant to an antibiotic and infect Africans with that. When I return, the same is true. I could come back with an organism which I was, with which I was infected in Central Africa and bring it back into the United Kingdom. That makes international cooperation even more crucial. With specialized teams and laboratories setting up early warning systems to pit their skills against the ever-increasing threat of plague and disease. But all the chemical ingenuity and antibiotic technology in the world is often fighting a losing battle against the even more ingenious virus, which can rapidly adapt to new prevention regimes. It's catch-22. It's not nature striking back. It's the process of natural selection in operation. Um, if we apply a selective pressure, like mass immunization of our children against the measles virus, that provides an enormous selective pressure on that virus to change so it can escape the attentions of the vaccine. And that's not premeditated thought by the virus. That's the struggle for the survival of the fittest. It's Darwin's notion of natural selection. It is a battle between the bugs and man. And, and bugs are, are winning the battle right now. They survive by developing resistance to what man has developed to treat them. And so there's a constant battle, which at present the microbes appear to be winning. Infectious diseases killed 17 million people in 1995, and while new ones appear as if from nowhere, others are making a comeback. These are the real doomsday bugs. They're with us now and gaining ground. For mankind, the battle is not on the field of Armageddon, but in the fields of science and technology. So where does that leave the doomsday prophets? 
these prophets of doom and disaster uh, are mostly exaggerating very slim or negligible evidence. They have no real proof of that anything like that will happen. And I think what they're appealing to is the general public's great need for certainty. They love certainty. It helps them through their lives. And of course, they turn to religion for it. Now, it's not the job of scientists to be certain about anything. In fact, our profession requires us always to know that our theories can never be certain and uh, that they will be superseded. And uh, so when you ask scientists about to make predictions into the future, I think if they're good ones, they will be most uncertain and not be able to tell you what will really happen. Peddling in disasters is uh, not something that we need to, need to get worried about, but it is something we need to think about. And I think we've not thought about it nearly enough. And with our greater knowledge now of what's happened in the past, we should now bend our minds to this issue. Every human society ahead of ours in the past has failed for one reason or another. Every human society has collapsed. Now, is ours going to crash too? The statistical possibilities are that it will, or at least it will change. And I think we want to be on the, on the winning side. If it is going to change, we want to be the people who do the changing. We don't want to find ourselves being hit on the back of the head as on treading on a garden rake, as happened, has happened every single time before in the past to a human civilization. Of course, what makes our civilization different are those white knights of technology ready to ride to the rescue. I have strong views on technology, or at least on people's understanding of it. It's pretty well ethically neutral. You can have very good technology, which is no threat whatsoever to us or to the Earth. And I think into that category comes much of the information revolution. I, I would guess that technology has equal chances of being our doom or our salvation. And I don't know. Nobody knows. It depends how we use it. And what's our leading technology? Computers. When we celebrate the new millennium, doomsday bugs of a technological kind are about to be unleashed. Every computer relies on an internal clock for almost all its calculations. But early computer designers economized on memory by using two instead of four digits for the year number. So the computer sees 1999 as nine and nine. And as the midnight hour chimes in the year 2000, the clock will reset to zero, zero. But the computer won't know what century it's in. The result could be chaos all round, affecting every aspect of our lives, from package tours to pensions. It'll cost one and a half thousand billion dollars to put right. Or can we do it in time? Or will ours, the first civilization steeped in technology, grind to a whimpering halt as we knock on Doomsday's door? Only time will tell. <laughs>